All right, I'll go first. Um, yep, you can first. Three, three quick cases here. Let's see here. I want to show my screen. I had kind of a dry week, but I dig. I dug a couple of ones out. But I'm hopefully, I one of them's fresh. I know, but um, this is a just kind of a fun case. It's not a diagnostic conundrum or anything. So um, I'll show you that. I should have gotten the smoother kernel. I'll see if I can dig that up. But, um, nice case here of uh, classic relapsing polychondritis, where you see the thickening and calcification of the cartilaginous portions of the trachea, main bronchi. You can see the airway stenosis, um, the usual findings, really tight bronchus intermedius, kind of goes pretty far out. Uh, that's old histo in the right lower lobe. But what's kind of cute with this case is the head CT. And you can see the calcifications in the cartilaginous portions of the ears, the, the pinna and the aleatory canal, which I've never seen, but to be fair, I've never looked for it. Wow, yeah. Just kind of fun, but it makes sense they get inflammation. And this would be a later stage of the disease. Uh, early on, you see thickening of the, or you know, inflammation of the cartilage, but it doesn't calcify. And same goes with the trachea. And then it can, with time, become scar down and become more rigid and calcified. So. Jeff, how about the nasal cartilages? Oh, yeah. Was it also Good calcified? Idea. Good idea. I didn't even look. Uh, yes, indeed. I mean, some of that's bone, but I think it's a little too much. Don't you agree? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm trying to, oh, the tip of the nose is where most of the cartilage is. It doesn't appear to be because there's the, uh, the, the vomer and the yeah. nasal bones, but it doesn't look like it. But maybe I don't know how much of that's cartilage versus bone in the in the, in the nasal nasal cavity. Okay, um, this is just another nice, but a really nice example. This is a lady who has some fairly long-standing liver failure, has been listed for transplant, and has known hepatopulmonary syndrome. But this is one of the nice cases where you can see the little spidery vessels going out to the surface, the little telangiectetic vessels, not just dependent, but also in the non-dependent one. And they get um, uh, platypnea, where they they're more short of breath, lying, uh, stand, sitting up than when they're when they're supine. And you can see these relatively large vessels going out. And on um, I don't have an echo, but on the bubble study, it showed microscopic shunting, you know, delayed shunting, so extra cardiac shunting, which you can see with these these folks. Um, but this is the typical findings I've seen. I've you know, other than the cirrhotic liver morphology, et cetera, is these little telangiectetic vessels. Um, sometimes you have some peripheral ground glass, which is probably just enlarged vessels, and these little transplural, I guess they're transplural collaterals of some sort. And then this was my fresh case. This uh, was a follow-up that came from a regional health department. This was an immigrant from um, a part of uh, Northern Africa where TB is endemic. And um, let me just show you the evolution. And this is what's kind of cool. And I don't see a lot of TB, so maybe those of you who do can chime in. So this goes back to 2016, so almost two years ago at this point. Patient presents with a solitary nodule in the right upper lobe. There's probably another one hiding in here. Don't see any lymphadenopathy, no pleural effusion. The next time we see the patient is, um, let's see, that was July. And then we go ahead to uh, the following year, not till April, when the patient develops some more symptoms and now has a larger area of consolidation, a little lucency in the middle of it. Presented at that point to a, an ED somewhere with chest pain. You can see the ECG lead. So that is the initial one was July of 16. This is uh, April of 17. And then let's see, we have... December of that year. I don't think the diagnosis of TB had been made. Now we see more extensive lobar consolidation. Cavity is more conspicuous. There's a larger nodule component. And now we've developed this nodule on the left. So looking more TB like here, you know, but it's been smoldering now for um, almost a year and a quarter, a year and a half at this point. Um, wow. Fast forward, so at that point, they get a CT scan for pulmonary embolism at the outside hospital. And here is the CT from the same day, and we can see the necrosis, the consolidated lung, the cavity, uh, just really ugly looking, and the typical downstairs component where you see a little bit of debris in the lower lobes uh, from some little tree and bud 
in the middle of very fuzzy there at that point, but already spreading to the other side. And then there's that nodule with a little cavitation in it. So spreading through the airways, there's the cavitation. And then I have a CT scan from just about, oh, it's about a week and a half later than that. I don't know why it was repeated. It was done on the outside. Um, I don't know if it was here. Let's see. Whoops. Yeah, what about nodes? Were there any lymph nodes in the media? Yeah, well, they're big, but they're not the typical ugly TB nodes. They look more reactive than your typical necrotic um, TB looking nodes. I don't know if the esophagus is involved at all. It looks pretty thick, but at this point, you can see there's more endobronchial spread. Nice tree and leaf. Ooh. Yeah, it's springtime already here. Not, not really. Um, but yeah, just, just the evolution. And then this is the one I came across today from the health department, uh, is this, um, you can see it, it, um, starting to kind of go away. I don't have the hard copy of the one, but this is slowly getting better. This nodule sort of resolving as well, but I've not seen TB, you know, I've seen it spread through the airways, but I've never seen it cause large nodules like this on David and, and I know you and Travis have seen a lot of TB, maybe Howard as well, but where you get these sort of dominant you know, something like like this it looks more like fungus when I see this. Yeah, I guess it's just the severity and the chronicity that is a bit unusual. Yeah, really bad compared to the, yeah. the airway spread of stuff. Yeah, the airway spread's nice, but this was this was drug sensitive as, as far as I know. The patient's slowly getting better, but I suspect the diagnosis was probably delayed until at least eighteen months after the initial radiograph given that there was no, wow. it progressed and there was no treatment. So I think it's when they did the CT scan at the outside facility, they determined that maybe this indeed is TB and not something else. But I think it was probably, a, my guess it was a nodule, a community, because I mean, if you go back to April, I mean, that's where it was. And when the patient initially showed up um, in 2016, it was a solitary lung nodule. Maybe it had a little friend next to it, but that's about it. Okay, well, that's what I have this week, but. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can track down any additional information on it, but I doubt it because it's all it's all outside health department stuff. All right, who'd like to go next? I've got a couple of cases. All right. Go, David. Yep. Can we see a rentogram all? Good. No. Nope. Yep. Oh, yes. There it is. Yes. Okay. We have a cavitation here with fluid level and nodule stuff here in the right apex in this roughly 70-year-old person with a history of uh, asthma. And he uh, has this CT scan showing several cavities, cavitary nodules in the right upper lung, pretty clear lung bases. And um, there was, uh, I think, bronchoscopy here, and an organism was uh, cultured from this. And this is, the organism is a fungus called Purpureocilium iliacum, il iliacinum. And this was formerly Paesilomyces. Uh, and I've shown a case before in this conference of of uh, Paesilomyces. I think it's all been recategorized, and I think Paesilomyces is now, myces are now categorized under this genus of Purpureocilium. So this is Purpureocilium iliacinum in a person with um, all the only background being asthma, clean living person. Uh, does, some does seem to have a dilated trachea. Perhaps azagous lobe is a risk factor for this fungus. But if there were any mechanical risk factor, it would probably have something to do with this dilated trachea and proximal bronchi. Okay. No steroid therapy, huh? Necessarily. I don't, think, no, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think this person's on steroids. So uh, there have been a couple of cases of this. This is what things look like currently now. So there's been a considerable amount of clearing of this right upper lobe stuff, but there's some residual scar. And I think I have an, an article here. So here is a case report of this organism, Purpureocilium iliacinum, or iliacinum, causing cavitary pulmonary nodules. And here is a, a similar lesion to what we have. We just we have more lesions. Ours are better than in this report. And they stress that this was 
an, an unusual finding. It's not that often associated with um, you know, disease manifestations in people. But I have two, at least two other cases under the old genus name, Hacillomyces, that probably correspond to this. So, David, any association with smoking uh, recreational uh, plants? I don't think so, uh, at least not, not in here. But, you know, based on the few number of cases, I think it's pretty hard to get much epidemiology out of this. Okay, so they're saying this is the first case of cavitary pulmonary disease caused by this. I have a feeling if, you, if they looked at the older names, they would find some cases that would now correspond to this organism. Um, you know, and our, the species name in the, the two, or, two or three other cases I have was not Iliacinum or Iliacinum. It was something else, but um, same, same genus now. The genus, this new genus name has taken over. Wow. Okay, so there's an unusual fungus infection, uh, fungal infection. And um, let me show you this person uh, who's had who has multiple myeloma, you can see that a lot of bone lesions here representing, I think, healed pathologic fractures from myeloma. This person got sick. So uh, several weeks later, you can see that there is consolidation in both bases. You can see it nicely. It's more, uh, more pronounced here on the right, but it's also involving the left lower lobe as well. And a CT scan was performed around this time. And that shows us some airways infection here in upper lobe, small airways, nodules, or tree and bud sort of pattern, and then this uh, bigger consolidation, worrisome consolidation in right base. And it has kind of a dense rim around it and then the laciness in the center that's a uh, bird's nest sort of pattern. Let's see if that holds up on coronal imaging. Is it bird's nesty? Because they got mucor out of this person uh, Rhizopus, and they got Aspergillus. I think the lesion in the right base corresponds to the um, mucor, the Rhizopus. And here it is abutting the diaphragm, and um, it seems to actually be extending into the liver at this point. So the person was at, at varying times during the course of this has been coughing up blood, angioinvasive rhizopus mucor like this can infarct lung. And um, I think that's probably what's going on here. This does not enhance on a later CT, which I will show you now. So things, uh, first of all, let me show you that things progressed. We have more and more consolidation. And then around that time, we have this CT scan, which shows uh, much bigger pneumonia and a nice, again, bird's nest configuration of the dense rim and then the lacy center looking like a bird's nest here. With, and with contrast on board, you can see there's no enhancement here. This is really necrotic lung, probably because mm. of no invasion. And then we seem to have this encroachment on the PEPAR. And you can see, again, dramatically here with contrast, the invasion across the diaphragm into liver by this uh, zygomycete here. So um, there, there's also a... <clears throat> um, Abnormalities of the spleen here. I think this is probably embolic infarction of spleen. I, you know, we do have we do have continuity here of lower lobe pneumonia on the left, but I don't. This doesn't really look like invasion of the spleen the way we have invasion of the liver on the other side. So I wonder if this is more uh, embolic abnormality here of spleen. So this person is on maximal antifungal coverage, has not recovered counts does not have a good prognosis, but it's an I think it's a dramatic example of how uh, mucor likes to cross boundaries, doesn't respect boundaries like pleura, diaphragm, and liver capsule. It just moves across all of these structures and is also angioinvasive and will induce infarction of lung. Okay, so two That's from... I'm, I'm sorry? Has anyone seen that before where it actually invades adjacent structures like this or to this extent? Shares smaller. Seen, I'm trying to think back if I've seen one like that. I've seen, I've seen mediastinum. Right. Wow. And I've seen chest wall, chest wall before. Because, I mean, that's impressive. The diaphragm is pretty tough. Yeah. And it's moving up. Yeah. That's right. Wow. I mean, when I, that is, 
scalable. Okay. All right. So keep using your Desinex powder, guys. Don't uh, don't let up on you know tenactin. I take oral tenactin. You know I don't I don't want this to happen to me. Okay. Um, so my final case is um, is a Howard inspired case. This woman has a history of sarcoma of the lower extremity that was irradiated and then um, was uh, re resected. And she comes in with this for the screening rate gap. She does have some adelectus or scar down here, but she has this faint nodule in the right apex here and uh, a ghost like version, perhaps on the other side at this level. And this goes back to an old um, finding that was reported by Tony Proto back in the 80s or 70s. So I, I refer to this phenomenon as the apical opacity of Proto. Uh, Proto wrote an article called the apical opacity. So it's Proto's, uh, it was a very good description. And so I wonder if you guys are familiar with this Proto opacity, this apical opacity. Is this, does this ring any bells or is it just um, us old timers that recall this? Well, I see it all the time, but I, did, I forgot the name of it. Okay, well. Well, can you add that up? Because it's not the one that, that has the morphology or the appearance that I associate with the so-called apical cap of proto. Th this is not a cap, right? No, it was what, what he described was as best I recall was an apical opacity that is the anatomic left subclavian or right subclavian artery. Yes. Which uh -huh. well, different not subclavian. Right. Brachycephalic artery, subclavian artery. And that's exactly what this is. So here's the CT on this person. Um, so it is this structure here, which is the subclavian artery. So let's let's follow it out. Here it is going out into the into the chest wall. And we come down a little bit. You can see that it indents lung. And that's why we get this vague opacity in lung here, because we have these this displacement of lung a little bit. It's got sometimes has fuzzy, fuzzy margins. The same thing's going on on the other side, not quite as pronounced indentation of lung. It's not quite as strong a shadow on the left as it is on the right. But it is this brachycephalic. Or, um, sorry, at this point, it's probably subclavian artery um, heading out toward. <laughs> the shoulder and indenting lung anteriorly. So I think the time Proto described this was in the very early days of chest CT. A lot of his anatomic stuff from the 70s and 80s was before there was good CT correlation. So this is indeed a normal structure. Uh, it's a pseudotumor and it's caused by this uh, these branches of the artery. Here's uh, his article back from 1986 and he shows these vague apical opacities. It's usually in the circle of the first rib. So you find the first rib circle and it's somewhere in there. It's vague. It uh, doesn't have a sharp uh, lower lower boundary. It just sort of fades into view and then fades out. And here are other examples. This is all based on plain film imaging and um, nice drawings here. Okay, and so this is a pseudotumor to be aware of. I haven't seen that many examples recently. I have one from a couple of years ago, and then this one popped up this week. I've been looking for good examples. So can you bring that up again, the, the radiograph? Because that's lovely. And could you zoom it up and so we can see um, a little bit better the radiograph? And okay. zoom up to the apices if you can with the old mag. So can you click the... Uh, Let's what you could do is the little um, magnifying glass in your toolbar, click that. So we'll drag it down and mag it up. Okay, yeah. and let me work on the contrast here. Okay, you can see it better here. Maybe you do get a little hint of its tubularity here. Maybe you can see that it does have a vertical extent, but it's, it's more vague on the other side. So once again, mm -hmm. it's in the of the first rib. So, okay. uh, you know, there are a few things like this. You know, Proto also, he did a lot of really helpful stuff uh, in interpreting plane films, including showing us that sometimes you'll see this vague arc that sort of tracks in toward the mediastinum, leaving the chest wall and tracking in like this. 
and he called that mm -hmm. the zero lateral, you know, major fissure on both sides. And that's the result of um, uh, extra pleural fat being pulled into the fissure, and it's really outlining the top of the major fissure. So you see, you'll see these arcs on some chest people, uh, some chest radiographs, particularly in people who are have a little bit of extra fat on board. The fat is very uh, loose. The pleura can get sucked into fissure, and then you'll see the the edges of the major fissures. So that's another interesting phenomenon that I can lecture about. I you know I lectured about this you know 20 years ago, and people didn't know what that was. But Proto described that back in the early 80s or late 70s. As superior lateral fissures. I think that we should, I think as a group, we should put a bunch of these cases together with these sorts of classic misunderstandings about, uh, about chest radiographs and make it available again, R really refresh people's mind about the good work that was done by Proto and others way back in the days when people cared about anatomy on, on plain radiographs. What do you think, Jeff? You could call, you think, you could call the prototype, what? prototypical chest radiograph. There we go. You I, think that something, something we're talking about ATI? All the stuff you're talking about, I think we see all the time and we just don't even think about it. We probably don't yeah. even ask anymore because it's just it's there. But you stop to, you know, you get a medical student or a very junior resident and they ask you what it is and you have to, it's, sometimes you, you say, I don't know, it's just always there. David, I think even more than JTI, I know as a radiographics reviewer like the educational exhibits that come in we seldom get any plain film exhibits anymore for the rsna meeting yeah so if anybody's watching or listening to this and needs an idea you know there's a lot of radiography stuff that can be done uh-huh well i i would be delighted to help somebody um else do this sort of thing and you know tend it to um i mean i have a whole lecture about this, I would share it with somebody who could mobilize some residents or something to put together something for, uh, you know, radiographics for RSNA and then radiographics. That would be yeah. wonderful. I think it would be a service to the community because plain films haven't gone away. Right. But plain films are out there in big numbers still. So if, you know, if somebody has, um, as a resident who would like to go to work on this sort of thing, I'd be happy to help. So I might have one sitting right behind me, so <laughs> we'll be in touch. Does that person know that yet, or is that person yeah. soon to be apprised? No, that <laughs> person is aware. We'll discuss it and I'll work with that, but I think that would be great. Mm -hmm. One of my residents has actually done some really nice work on the hilum, sort of, you know, re, re going back with he's worked with Chris Meyer and kind of re gone back and. You know, he's doing his grand rounds on the Highland because that's such, it's still a t challenging area for even for the faculty and, you know, yeah. different interfaces. And nowadays you can use, he did some Photoshop work to sort of like bring stuff out. Um, you know, we, we've had some cases, I know Howard's some, shown some cases there, but talking about all the interfaces again and, and being able to use some graphics to kind of make it even more um, alive. Well, and then the multi-slice CT with three-dimensional three reconstructions is now possible in a way that wasn't even you right. know, 15 years ago. Right. So we, the average really anatomy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the the fat average. Where yeah. So, so did, it really helps. It's an interesting point. You mentioned you don't see that as much anymore, and you know when I think about, it, I see it like in our university students. I wonder if it's just with extra adipose tissue in the mediastinum, it you just lose that 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 interface. That's that's a good point. Yeah, that would do it. And I wonder if that goes with some other findings that we're used to, that, that have been described that we don't see much anymore. I mean, it's hard to even see the paratracheal areas. It's just all fat now. And, you know, look, yeah. I'm looking at this patient you're showing, it's a very thin patient and everything is very well defined. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right. Who? Uh, thanks for showing. All right. Travis or Howard? Yeah, I've got some. All righty. You see a pair of Rankinograms. Yes. Oh, hold on one second. Actually, let Howard go. Okay. Awesome.
All right. Uh, let me start with one that I've actually shown before because on the previous occasion, I'm not sure whether at that time this was recognized so readily. So let me go to the more recent one and show you findings that are very consistent with um, lung disease that was new. This is interestingly a combination of small nodular but also ground glass attenuating opacities that developed in the lungs, very diffuse or lobes. And you can see here that she did have a biopsy showing non-necrotizing granulomas. So this was made its way into my teaching file as an example of pembrolizumab associated sarcoidosis. And just recently, I think there's been a lot more written about it, but here's a letter I just by chance saw the other day. So this one is in the context of a letter to the editor and another article. And these folks also have a case of a sarcoid-like reaction in a patient also with melanoma, although my patient had a different cancer. This is melanoma treated with pembrolizumab. So this is, again, a letter to the editor about that. So I thought I would just show that again. Um, in this particular patient, again, it, it was pretty florid disease. And it did get better. So let me see if I have the follow-up. I haven't looked at that in a while. Let me just unlink these and bring it down. So the time course here after withdrawal of the pembrolizumab is that, and it definitely got better. And we had those granulomas. So pembrolizumab associated sarcoidosis or granulomatous disease. I love it. You know what's interesting, Howard? So I was—I I never can remember some, which what these different abs and things do. So it's a, you know, a checkpoint inhibitor, but interestingly, it's IgG four. And if you you wonder, like some of this, you know, some of these IgG four things we're encountering, if sort of this can induce it, just like sarcoid. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's. We're seeing, yeah, because I've seen a bunch of weird, you know, we see this with TNF alpha inhibitors as well. You get these sarcoid like reactions. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I thought I'd bring that one up again. I had one the other day that looked like this that I thought might be associated with in a patient on a fall fox regimen, one component of fall fox for. Intestinal malignancy is oxaloplatin, and that has been described also as producing a sarcoid reaction. So I may have another one, but if I can confirm it, I'll show it another time. Uh, this one over here is just kind of interesting. We've seen this kind of thing before. And here's a patient with, or at least this pattern before, with a fibrosing interstitial lung disorder. And if you look at the pattern, pretty flora disease, the distribution of the disease, the reticulation, the foci of traction bronchiectasis, particularly extensive in the left upper lobe. And you can see disease in the lower lung zones, but this isn't basal predominant disease. And perhaps there are areas of air trapping a little bit in the lower lung zones. But I think given the distribution of disease that and there's a lot of involvement of the apical lungs, that with the new classification for UIP would either be perhaps indeterminate because of the distribution, or I'm not sure about not consistent with UIP. So I don't know how you would interpret this other than a fibrosing lung disorder and to put it in those categories because of the extent of disease in the upper lung zone. So Howard, I, this case nicely illustrates a finding that I've seen a lot with hypersensitivity pneumonitis, where you get these bands of fibrosis, sort of like on that image on the right lung, that start in the periphery and kind of work their way along the, 
bronchovascular bundles almost across the entire slice of that up here. Lung. Yeah. And, and if you look, there's heterogeneity of the background lung. I see so, some expiratory images. I don't know if there was air trapping, which could be helpful. Not it doesn't rule it in or out. But, you know, on the IPF thing, I would say it's inconsistent because it's upper zone predominant. And, I, and I'm not convinced it's subpleural predominant, but right. this is yeah. a good look for HP. A lot of peribronchial. Yeah, and, right. And, and Jeff, I was going to say the same thing. It's it's perilobular fibrosis. I mean, it looks like that, almost like that perilobular sign that you can see with, with organizing pneumonia sometimes. Right. right. Just, yeah. Yeah. So this would be okay. one that, whatever the new terminology is, there are features that suggest an alternative diagnosis. Okay. I, I can't remember what that Fleischner white yeah. paper, what, what exactly they, the, yeah. the phraseology is they use. Yeah. Yeah, for the last one, not inconsistent with, but rather um, uh, not suggestive of UIP or an alternative diagnosis. So before I show you the actual PATH report, I think we all recognize that sometimes PATH also is hard to interpret. But I'm going to show you how a pathologist here described this one. And I think that... What I find interesting about this report is that it doesn't have features that are strongly suggestive of, for example, UIP, or features that, at least in the biopsy report, are very suggestive of, say, chronic HP. So, for example, it's fibrosis. Fibroblastic foci are present, but are relatively few in number. And there's no description, obviously, in here of granulomas. So I think that um, this is not really surprising because I don't think this pathologist could come down strongly. Although it talks about UIP and there's no histologic features that would suggest an alternative etiology, one wonders, number one, about how five expert pathologists would review one tissue biopsy and whether if tissue was taken somewhere else, it might have shown something different from what you see here. But, you know, when I read into this, it's not a clear-cut description of UIP in X case because it's a little bit more fuzzy than that, right? Yeah, it'd be interesting to know what, what section. I, I'm assuming they, they said three specimens, so I'm assuming it was a three-lobe biopsy. Yeah. yeah, this is where you have to have the exhaustive search for the yeah. ill-defined granulomas within the pathology. Yeah. And then or, sometimes... Or poorly happen. formed granulomas. Yeah. Sometimes you may not be able to make a diagnosis, even with pathology, and you just have to do your best um, in terms of making that diagnosis. But I would agree with you. This isn't what we would describe as either a UIP pattern or probable UIP pattern. It's either indeterminate or not suggestive of. And I get the feeling that the pathologist sort of feels the same way somewhat. It looks as like if there is some air trapping on your, do you have expiratory images? I don't yep. know what goes by, but I thought I saw some on in the thumbnails. There's um, maybe some lobules there, for example. Let on me both see sides. Looks mm -hmm. like both sides and... Not so much there though, or... Uh, you have some on the right lower yeah, I, and I think a little bit on the left in the left lower too. I I think this is pretty. This is probably a chronic HP, given that we do have some air trapping. We did have mosaic on the uh, on the ends, and you don't have very many expert expiratory things to confirm. I think we've got enough right. lobules here involved that I I would go that direction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think there's definitely air trapping up here, for example. Yeah. There, we've got yeah, yeah. yeah. I've read a lot of uh, pathology reports, and sometimes I can kind of intuit when there is some degree of uncertainty on the part of the pathologist about labeling the case with some confidence, right? And that's where I, I get that feel here. All right, this is just um, an example of another left atrial appendage exclusion device. So we have the watchman, which we've seen before. And I didn't know until recently that there is another one now. So 
I'll just show you a couple of images from, well, actually I only have this one image from the deployment of this one, which is this one. So, oops, that's what it looks like. So this is an Amplatza Amulet, A-M-U-L-T device, E-T device. And as you know, these are really hard to see on radiographs because they're not very opaque. But here you can see the deployment of it and you can see it's being opened up in here, this portion that looks like that. So if you see that, it may just be one of these Amplatza amulet devices, like the Watchman. Hmm. Just another one. Has, has anybody okay. seen, uh, we saw an esophageal device today, and I think I've seen one before, but I wasn't quite sure about it. It is a device to measure esophageal pH. Have you seen those things parked in the esophagus before? Yes, those yeah, those probes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bravo. 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 Yeah. it's called a Bravo uh, pH device. Bravo. Is, yep. that, is that familiar? Yeah, we've seen those before. Uh -huh. They have a very distinctive shape. If you have seen it before and you see it nicely on the lateral, you'll recognize it. It was sort of elongated. I thought it might be a swallowed earring. That's what I was worried about. Yeah. No, they have a distinctive appearance. B-R-A-V-O. Yeah. Oh, this is an interesting patient. I don't quite know what to make of this, but Fewa is going to show a patient with unrelenting episodes of necrotizing pneumonia, which in this patient has been described to, in the absence of any other potential cause, a recurrent aspiration. This is the kind of patient. So I'll show you at, at a point in time here, we have focal necrotizing pneumonia with liquefaction right here in the right middle lobe at a certain time. So this is November of 2017. The patient is treated for that. And let's see if I can actually go back to September, sorry. So this is going back into when she was first sent here in which the abnormality was relatively small, but you can see in the interim that that became quite a bit larger. Sorry about that, if I can make that come back. And you'll see that in time, this large area of liquefaction developed in there. So she was treated repeatedly. I don't think anything was ever cultured, but I'll go back to now December. So the difference in time here is November versus December. And I will show you that that looks really nasty there. So it's something that's really nasty. A lot of liquefaction, there's a little cavitation there. And you can see a new area has developed. Sorry, this is scrolling in the wrong direction. In the anterior right lower lobe. So we'll go forward in time. She's still treated with antibiotics and I've got lots of images. So I'm gonna to go to January and show you that these areas get better in the middle lobe, that anterior lower lobe gets better, but sure enough, she comes back in with symptoms, and this is part of an abdominal CT, and then you see these abscesses developing in the right lower lobe that look exactly like the other ones. So she keeps on developing these abscesses just repeatedly, and this is February. Now you can see that looks even nastier. Now she's got pleural fluid, there's kind of a split pleural sign. What's interesting about this is there's probably so much inflammation of pleura that there's even a little bit of extra pleural fluid. But in summary, this is a case of just unrelenting abscesses that just come and go and involve different areas in this lady. And other than suggesting it's aspiration, no one can quite understand why she does this. But really bad necrotizing pneumonia. So I don't know what else to think of in terms of an etiology for recurrent episodes of pneumonia over a period of months, just repeatedly. Oh, and there was an episode in which I thought I saw, let me just go back really quickly to maybe one somewhere in January. I thought there was 
oh, I can't remember for sure, but there were some very minor abnormalities in the left lower lung on one occasion. So I thought aspiration was a reasonable thought. But would you folks think of anything else or any particular reason why someone should get multiple abscesses over months? Some Have they all been on the right side? Uh, right side predominantly, yeah, the abscess is for sure on the right side. Uh -huh. Yep. Yeah, I, I think aspiration, I agree. You know, maybe they sleep on their right side or preferentially aspirate to that side. And the esophagus doesn't look totally normal. It's a little thicker and there's always a lot more gas. There's fluid in it on a couple scans. She's, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. That thought, yeah. You know, here's an example of a time when there's very sparse material, maybe within the lumens of a few bronchi or bronchioles there. So there was a little abnormality on the left side, a little patchy, but you can see it down there, little nodules. So I thought aspiration is presumably what's happening to this lady, but otherwise we can't explain why she gets these. Let's go back to September and see if we see anything on the left side. Here's a little bit in the right upper. So there is some abnormality in the right upper a little bit. And you can see all the, I think what supports the diagnosis of aspiration is you also get the idea that there are lots of bronchioles filled with material here in that right middle lobe. And this goes back to September of last year. That's right. And that airway makes me think aspiration. Look at these, look at these airways down here in the right lower lobe and that airway. Yeah, I do think aspiration is a likely possibility. I think there's aspiration bronchitis, bronchiolitis, and then she develops the horrible, oh, look at that. I forgot about that. That's back in September, right there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Convinced? Any, ever get any organisms out of her? Nope. Not that I know of. All right, Jeff, those are my cases. All right, thank you. All right, Travis, you ready? Yep. Let's hope my phone doesn't ring the moment I share my screen this time. Okay. Two Rankinograms side by side, 30 year old woman. And this was, she's had cough for about six weeks. And this, this one on the left, you can see looks normal. This was around the first of March. This one, you know, without the prior to, to compare to, you might argue that it's normal, but the more you look, you see there's some just kind of subtle, generalized subtle haziness and i think especially when you look on the lateral when you have the, these areas where you should see you know your retrocardiac space retrosternal space you can tease out faint little opacities and some of them look a little bit more nodular uh, but anyway and she went tubular. she went on what's that and also tubular maybe as in airways yeah they, i mean they just look i mean certainly it looks too busy and so she got pe study in the ed the other night and here you can see, you know, oh. this was right after that radiograph, just how diffuse these are. And so you have diffuse, more smudgy ground glass, but they're clearly central ovular nodules throughout. I think you can appreciate how different the attenuation of the lung is just based on the relative, the darkness of the bronchus, as we referenced before, like this idea of the black bronchus sign. Uh, but her, in her, and this is, this is like, I know I've mentioned this before, and I, I still have yet to find a case that fails this rule, is that as I've told my residents and fellows, whenever you have something that's this diffuse, it's not an infection. It's got to be some sort of exposure if it's airway centered or, of course, we've shown cases of excipient lung disease giving you diffuse stuff too. But you know, she had been treated with multiple rounds of antibiotics you know, for presumed community acquired pneumonia, which you know, we were pretty confident this was not. Her pulmonary artery, you know, maybe borderline here, there's motion, but her right ventricle is not dilated and she had no history of injecting. Uh, but, you know, looking at the chart, they didn't really indicate anything in her social history. And so we called them and told them this has got to be some sort of exposure, specifically mentioning, you know, asking the question, she's 30, is she smoking marijuana or synthetic marijuana or anything? And so they, the pulmonologists were consulted. And then the pulmonologist asked them that she's been vaping marijuana a few nights a week for the last few weeks. And she may have smoked some from a pipe you know, late last month before she you know, had these symptoms. 
So, you know, the, the one thing I don't understand about this, I mean, clearly this looks like more of like an acute hypersensitivity pneumonitis type yeah. reaction rather than some of the cases we've shown like the synthetic marijuana where you get that more severe lung injury. And so I don't know if, it, if this is, you know, the, is it mold on the marijuana, like just old leaves? Or is this just a hypersensitivity to something in the leaf itself? I don't, we don't know, but I think it's pretty convincing that that's what this is. And so they've, this, her viral panel was negative. They stopped her antibiotics and have started her on steroids. Yeah. So Travis, you said she was vaping it. So you wonder maybe her, her pipe is dirty or there's the, you know, kind of like a aerosolized, yeah. like a hot tub yeah. variant or a hook along. We've seen a hook along. Yeah. Well, I, you have a hook along too. Maybe, I showed her. I don't know. Maybe we talked about it. We talked where well, we were talking about it. Yeah. For a while. Or maybe we talked about it. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, but the, the point is it's some sort of exposure and I guess it's a hypersensitivity reaction in this case, whatever it is, you know, but, specifically uh, to the, to the marijuana or something else. Yeah. I don't know. Travis, what does vaping mean? I mean, did, did, is this hot? Is this, um, is this dabbing where they where they burn the marijuana on a really hot, you know, a red hot piece of metal? Well, know, sorts of smoke, yeah. or is there a solution that she's made, or is this something commercial it's, that she bought? It's a it's a thermal thing, and and I don't know. And I was we were joking about this with the pulmonologist this morning. I I don't I don't vape, so I don't know exactly. But we were saying that we should all just get together and you know figure out how this stuff actually works so we can understand it better. But ask her to bring it in. Our guy who yeah. was who was dabbing brought in his material, you know, his uh, apparatus, and we photographed it, everything like that. Yeah. So I think it's important to know what people are doing, what the product is. Hey, David. Yeah. I purely found this on Google, but if you go to Leafly, L-E-A-F-L-Y dot com, it talks about cannabis vaporizers. And you can see all the different paraphernalia, but you can see how this would, it, it, it puts it into an aerosol. So whatever, whether it's a bacteria or fungus on the plant, or it's something in dirty pipe. That's how it gets aerosolized into the lung, or it's a solvent, or something like that. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. But so, well, that's on the radio. I called the well, volcano. <laughs> huh. Well, yeah. this still fits my rule that whenever you see something this diffuse, that it's you know almost certainly not going to be infectious. I mean, maybe yeah. pneumocystis in the appropriate context, but. You know, you especially like viral pneumonia and stuff, just not going to do this. And it's not the airway abnormality that I that I misperceived on the radiograph. I thought I was going to see airway abnormality, but it's not that at all. Yeah, it's just a it's just a con. You know, it's just a summation of all those tiny little central lobular nodules. Yep, exactly. Now Travis, here's one. Yeah, there wasn't large airways disease there. There wasn't bronchial wall thickening on that last person, was there? No, I don't. No. Let me go back and look, but I don't think there was. Okay. No. no, those, those bronchi look pretty good. So it's purely a, a bronchiolitis. No. Yep. HP lab. All right. Yeah. Now this one, to contrast this, I think it's a good time to show this one. This, this is a patient who's immunosuppressed. I think they have multiple myeloma and have been on chemo. And here's, this patient came in with acute respiratory illness. And in this case, you can see that there's, there are definitely findings of a bronchiolitis and, and in, just as David said, there's a little bit of bronchial wall thickening too. So it's more of a bronchitis and bronchiolitis. Mm -hmm. And it's contrasting it with the other case. It's bilateral, but it's not really diffuse in the sense that there are areas, it's not a uniform, you know, it's more of a heterogeneous distribution. And you can tease out little central lobular nodules, maybe some areas that are almost tree and bud. And I think, you know, certainly in a case like this, you know, this is a good look for a viral pneumonia. So you always, ask, I always ask what their for viral bronchiolitis slash bronchitis, always ask what their viral panel is. And this turned out to be, this guy was positive for metanumovirus. So it's just a good example, I think, of a, of a viral infection in the lung. And we can see how it evolved. This was a few, this was days later and he was not, I don't think he, no, he never ended up intubated, but it certainly progressed but I think, yeah, and it's a little bit more uniform now too. And you have more of these just more almost acinar nodules as some people might call them, that just still central lobular airway centered process. So, and I don't, I don't know. I, I know that there's a lot of, 
or there have been some publications and educational exhibits like focusing on different appearances of different viral pneumonias. I don't know. I just, I kind of all just lumped them all together. And I like Tomas's article from radiology in, 20, in 2011, where he talks about five major ca categories of findings that you may see. And we see most of those in this case. Don't, maybe not a lot of mosaic attenuation from, from air trapping in this case, but the other findings I think are all present in this case. So, but just contrasting the, you know, the the diffuse versus the relatively diffuse but still heterogeneous appearance, like in this case. Yes. And one, right. one of the things that happens with uh, with viral infections is that um, they mostly affect upper lungs, and a lot of times the stuff that you see in the bases and some I think I think it's operating in this case as well is the crud that was generated in the upper parts of the lung that gets aspirated into lower lobes. Mm. A, lot of the, a lot of times the lower lobe pattern is different from the upper lobe pattern, and it's coarser and heavier, like in this, in this case. Yeah. That's a lot of debris that ends up filling up the lower lobe bronchi. Interesting. That's cool. Very dramatic. All right. Just, I've got a, a series of good radiographs that have come in recently. And just getting back to the basic stuff that we see here, you can see this is a patient who's 25. I don't remember what their symptoms were, hemoptysis or some sort of upper airway symptoms. But you can see, you know, you, I think you see that there's this medial right lung and mediastinal opacity. And notice also the volume loss. I'm sure everybody on here quickly notices the volume loss, a clue that there may be some degree of atelectasis. And in fact, you know, suspicious that this is the minor fissure that's displaced right here. And it's kind of a very compressed reverse S sign of golden. You know, on the lateral, there's not much to say other than I think you don't see the right upper lobe bronchus that you should see somewhere in this area. And there's some thickening. We don't really see a great bronchus intermedius or, or intermediate stem line here. So even in young patients, we think of obstructing airway lesions. And in this case, you can see there's a big tumor extending into the, the right mainstem bronchus, obstructing the right upper lobe bronchus. There's a little bit of calcification. So you'd think that this was probably a carcinoid based on the location. They took it out. It actually turned out to be an, a mucoepidermoid tumor. Pretty low grade, though. But, you know, it's another minor salivary gland tumor that we occasionally see in the trachea. I think this may be the first one I've actually seen in a bronchus rather than in the trachea itself. But they were able to take this out, do a lobectomy, and do a reconstruction of that bronchus. And it was fairly low grade, so I think the patient has a reasonable prognosis. Yeah, very instructive. Yeah, now this one, I think, uh, I think Howard especially will like this case, because this is one where the more you look, the more you see. And there's an obvious finding this patient has, and this is another young patient, 37 years old, has right lower lobe consolidation. And certainly, you, it was, this was diagnosed as pneumonia somewhere else, and certainly that would be reasonable. But if you look more closely at the mediastinum and the airways, you can see that there's this very subtle narrowing of not just the right, but of also the left main stem bronchus in the kind of in the subcorinal space right here. And the lateral is just kind of a, I don't know, it's hard to see. This looks like the right upper lobe bronchus right here, but it's kind of a, a mess in this area. So it's, the lateral is not really that instructive, but the, the airway mass wasn't detected at first. I think he ended up going, undergoing a CT because he is having hemoptysis as well. And now you can just see the extent of this. And you can see just how much narrowing there is of both bronchi from this. And then he has, you know, something that looks like it's in the airway here. And then this being a combination of mass right here, I think there's some splaying out of the way of, of the vessels in this area and then a post-obstructive pneumonia. So we were hoping, you know, that this would be something like a carcinoid tumor that was here obstructing or maybe even lymphoma. It's kind of weird given this amount of, of lymphadenopathy that he had. I can't even remember. I think, yeah, this ended up unfortunately being a high-grade squamous cell carcinoma of his right lower lobe that had already metastasized. And this whole thing on PET was a mass right here. So 
pretty subtle radiograph, but I think it's always a reminder to when a patient has a low bar process like a pneumonia, always look at the airways too. I mean, not that you'll frequently see this, but occasionally. Travis, so he's pretty young, right? 37? Yeah. So did they test yep. the tumor for HPV? Yes, and it was negative. Oh. Yeah, because we were thinking, right, was there some, was it, was there pre-existing papillomatosis or just HPV and it was negative? But that's a, yeah, we were thinking the same thing because that's, I think it's just bad luck in his case. Wow. Let's see, I'll show one more quick one. This came from the general and, you know, it's just kind of an exciting case in some, in some terms, but this patient was intubated in the field and all we, that's all we really know. And I don't even know exactly what this is, but it is in the left main stem bronchus and it's, you know, six teeth in a row here. So I don't know if this is some sort of dentures or if it's a younger patient with some sort of dental adornment, but it's a, it's a fun one to, to show your residents perhaps. And it looks like there's some sort of lung injury or edema pattern here in this case that this patient, you know, found down. I don't know what exactly the history is, but they're, we don't have access to the records because they were, came in as a stat unidentified patient. And by the time they took this out, they lost track of this patient. But Wait. nice little aspiration of, of some sort of dental material. So. All right, well, Jeff, that's it for me here. All right, could I, could I crowd in one more case quickly here that Chris Walker sent? Of course. Okay. This is apropos of a conference, a uh, recent conference where we were talking about pericardial pleural plaques. And usually what people mean by that is something that is in the medial pleura of, of the lung. It's not really pericardial. But this is a case that Chris Walker, who saw that conference, sent me and asked, asked for a consultation. This is clearly pericardial calcification here. It's away from the pleural surface of the lying mediastinum, and it's on both sides. And this person does have asbestos pleural plaque in the pleural region. So this is the first case I've ever seen that really suggested that there was actually pericardial pleural plaque rather than medial pleural uh, pleural plaque. And I've never seen anything like this. And only there wasn't a lot of calcification elsewhere. So this wasn't a diffuse calcified pericarditis. You can see pericardium looks quite normal up here. So it really does seem to be plaque-like rather than diffuse calcification. So... Uh, this is the only time I've ever seen something that really looked like pericardial um, pleural plaque or pericardial plaque. So I want to share Chris's case. So thank nice. you, Chris. Okay, guys. Thank All you. Right. Well, thank yeah, you. Thank you. All right. See everybody next week. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.